I officially transferred ownership of our house to my parents. While he and I were talking about a divorce, Charles violently pointed at me and ordered that I leave the house. Charles had an indifferent, distant demeanor. As he unleashed a barrage of insults, his parents looked on in blissful quiet, supporting his actions. I ignored the awful things they said. I had anticipated this moment, having mentally and emotionally readied myself for it. I calmly packed up my things and walked out of the house. They had no idea how bad the situation they had put themselves in was or how soon the storm would arrive. My name is Mary, and I recently turned 55. After a lengthy marriage, Charles and I now have grown children who live happy, independent lives separate from us. I was a conventional salaried employee before a buddy introduced me to the world of teaching people how to make handcrafted products. It began as a hobby, but has now become a fulfilling career. This new stage of my life has given me such contentment and happiness. I find fulfillment in my everyday interactions with my students, and the simple act of creating has come to be a source of comfort and peace for me. Some people may take offense at my turning a passion into a career, but I genuinely don't mind. I had a chance to meet Charles at the company where I used to work. Our bond blossomed over social and professional events while he worked for a client business. We finally decided to tie the knot after falling in love. We were lucky to have a healthy, lovely child after five years of marriage. He grew into a bright young man, graduated from a prestigious university, got married, and is now living a successful, happy life. Despite our son's achievements, Charles and I had a worsening relationship over time. When he finally transformed, I hardly recognized the kind and gentle guy I had married. Charles lost his temper and began acting more like a servant than a partner. His constantly shifting tastes and demands were too much for me to bear, and nothing I tried would seem to please him. These days, he gets angry easily and accuses me of the littlest things. I feel emotionally depleted and exhausted since there has been a rise in verbal abuse. I did everything I could to keep our family together and keep the peace, but it was clear that Charles had become someone I could no longer live with. The love and respect that had once defined our marriage had been replaced by resentment and anger. As I walked out of the home, I felt that this was the right thing to do for both my future and myself. It was time to reclaim my identity, my happiness, and my calm. I had to acknowledge the reality of our situation, despite the fact that our marriage was filled with hope and love at first, and lasted for a very long period. Charles had several chances to demonstrate to me how much he was hurting me and to turn around, but I had lost hope in him. Knowing that I made the right choice for me as I begin this new chapter of my life, I feel relieved. Even though breaking up with someone is never easy, there are times when letting go is necessary to reach your own goals. My desire to start again and move on from this life has been growing, but I'm being held back by an unpaid mortgage. Charles made matters worse by unexpectedly quitting his job without giving a reason and spending all of his time at home. He seldom ever offers assistance, Therefore, I have to handle all the responsibilities and work by myself. The recent renovation of the house where we presently live was overseen by me. I gradually became frugal with my money, putting away cash for its restoration. This house represents my aspirations, my labors, and all I have ever wanted. It is so much more than just a place for me to live. I have given this house all I have and I cannot face the thought of it falling into Charles's hands if I were to leave. Beyond the financing issue, this house stands for my objectives. When I was planning it, I was very particular about every little thing and made sure to include all the things I've always wanted, including a big kitchen. Charles first assisted a bit, but since I was the one who paid for everything, I felt that my choices would be respected. Despite the obstacles we faced along the way, the home ultimately took shape, 
and had every feature I had envisaged. I was thrilled to see the results of all my hard work when we moved in since it was so fulfilling to see something tangible. However, the true cost of construction ended up being far more than we had projected. We were only able to pay off a much larger debt than we had anticipated. Taking on such a big debt in our 50s was not an easy decision, but I believe the pleasure our new home provided would make it worthwhile. For me, the house was a dream realized, but Charles wasn't as thrilled. He sulked, his complaints lingering, because his opinions weren't as reflected in the final design as he'd hoped. He even went so far as to say the house was a waste of money, comparing it to throwing cash down the drain. Ignoring his grumbling, I pressed forward, knowing the house was everything I had hoped for. But his attitude worsened. Gradually, Charles stopped talking to me, resorting to childish behavior like leaving trash scattered around and disorganizing the house on purpose. Small, spiteful acts aimed at irritating me. Each day, I wondered when this tension would end, when I could finally break free from this toxic cycle. These thoughts weighed on my mind constantly as I tried to navigate the delicate balance between my love for the home I built and a strained marriage that now threatened to suffocate me. A few months after we moved into the new house, something unexpected happened. The doorbell rang one afternoon. We weren't expecting any visitors, so I was curious about who it could be. As I'd prepared to head to the door, Charles surprisingly got up before I could. It struck me as odd since he rarely made any effort to be involved in anything these days. It seemed like he knew who the visitor was. After a short while, cheerful voices and laughter came from the entrance, a stark contrast to the usual tension in our home. When the door to the living room slowly opened, it revealed the visitors. When I opened the door, I was greeted by the faces of my unexpected in-laws, Kevin and Carolyn. Seeing them was always a source of tension for me. From the moment Charles and I announced our marriage, they treated me coldly, criticizing me for my lower social status and showing an awkward attitude. Even on our wedding day, their interference didn't stop after the wedding either, and each encounter with them left me feeling uneasy, always wondering how to handle the situation. Over time, as our contact with them decreased, I thought things might have settled down. That's why their sudden visit caught me off guard. I greeted them politely, trying to mask the slight tension I felt, but they walked right past me without so much as a word, one of them even bumping into my shoulder as if I weren't there. They immediately began marveling at the house, particularly the spacious, user-friendly kitchen that I had designed with so much care. Charles, now eager and proud, gave them a full tour of the house, showing off all the details. When they returned to the living room, their expressions seemed satisfied, as though they were impressed. But then Charles's face hardened, and suddenly he raised his voice at me, demanding that I hurry and prepare tea and snacks for his parents. His tone caught me off guard, and I rushed to get everything ready as quickly as I could. Despite my best efforts, Kevin and Carolyn seemed dissatisfied, making subtle remarks about the hospitality. Kevin, in particular, barely finished his tea before expressing his dissatisfaction, though he did take a moment to compliment the interior of the house. Then, with a broad smile on his face, Charles invited his parents to live with us in the house. He spoke as if I wasn't even there, as if my thoughts and feelings didn't matter. His parents seemed to take his words seriously and left soon after, satisfied with the idea. As I watched them leave, I couldn't help but feel the enormous gap between Charles and me widening further. He was laughing and chatting with his parents, something I hadn't seen him do in a long time, and it reminded me of how distant he had become. After that day, Charles's parents began visiting more frequently. At first, it was just a few times a month, but soon their visits increased to several times a week. Before I knew it, they were coming over nearly every day, 
and with each visit, their criticisms of me intensified. No matter what I did, it was never good enough for them, and Charles never stood up for me. In fact, he started blaming me more. He constantly complained that I didn't listen, and he even accused me of causing stress for our son, which felt like a baseless attack. Despite how frustrated and hurt I was, I couldn't seem to find the courage to speak up. Every time I wanted to defend myself, the words got stuck in my throat, and all I could do was offer apologies. The in-laws' visits didn't just increase. They started coming over even when I wasn't home, often arriving with Charles. I would return to find empty beer cans and bottles scattered around the house and spilled alcohol soaking into the new rug I had bought with such care. The house, which I had worked so hard to make perfect, began to smell of alcohol and feel dirty. I protested, of course. I asked Charles to intervene, but he ignored me, brushing off my concerns. It was as if my feelings didn't matter anymore. The house I had dreamed of, the house that was supposed to be our sanctuary, was slowly becoming a place where I felt trapped and powerless. The more his parents came, the more I felt like a stranger in my own home, and the more distant Charles became from me. I couldn't understand why Charles, who contributed nothing to the household, was always the first to complain. His growing involvement in gambling added another layer of stress to my life. Almost daily, I would find discarded betting slips, constant reminders of his risky habit. No matter how many times I tried to explain the dangers of gambling and the impact it was having on our finances, my words fell on deaf ears. The losses were devastating, especially since the money he was gambling away was the result of my hard work and long hours. Nearly a month into the in-laws' frequent visits, they had become bolder, often coming over when I wasn't home. One day, I returned earlier than expected and found them lounging in my house as if it were their own. I confronted them, but their snarky remarks and dismissive attitude made it clear they considered my presence an inconvenience. Frustrated and stressed by the sheer audacity of Charles and his parents, I realized I had reached my breaking point. Instead of letting my emotions take over, I knew I had to come up with a plan to address the situation. During this chaotic time, something strange happened. The in-laws visited one day when I was supposed to be away. Their odd timing caught me off guard, and I sarcastically commented on how they always seemed to avoid me. Ignoring my remarks, they brazenly entered the house. Charles greeted them with a welcoming smile and led them on a tour, showing off different areas of the house, from the kitchen to the bathroom. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was a hidden agenda behind their visit. They inspected everything carefully, as if they were evaluating the place. When they left, they had satisfied expressions on their faces, as though they had confirmed something I wasn't aware of. Feeling uneasy, I questioned Charles about the inspection. He brushed off my concerns, telling me not to worry and insisting that it was none of my business. But his behavior made me suspect that he was hiding something from me. It felt like he was manipulating the situation, though I couldn't quite figure out what his end game was. All I could do was observe and wait, hoping to uncover the truth. Then one day after a long day at work, I came home to find a large moving truck parked in front of our house. The truck had the logo of a moving company called Moving Center. I was stunned. As I approached, I saw Charles talking with the truck driver and some company representatives. When he noticed me, he quickly looked away and disappeared into the house, avoiding any eye contact. My heart sank. But the biggest shock came when my in-laws arrived at the same moment. They greeted me casually, as if nothing unusual was happening, and Charles welcomed them inside with open arms. The atmosphere felt tense, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. As I followed them into the house, my suspicions were confirmed. The furniture and belongings I had known for years were gone. In their place was my in-law's old dated furniture, 
arranged as though they were preparing to move in permanently. It was as if my home, the house I had worked so hard for, was being turned into theirs without my consent. I stood there in disbelief, trying to process what I was seeing. My world felt like it was spinning out of control, and it became clear that Charles had been planning this behind my back for some time. His parents seemed smug, as if they had finally taken over, while I was left standing in the middle of what used to be my home, feeling like an outsider. I sat down on the sofa, surrounded by Charles and his parents, all wearing smug smiles that made it clear they had something planned. Their behavior radiated confidence, as if they had been waiting for this moment. Despite feeling anxious, I decided to remain quiet and see how things would unfold. My in-laws exchanged hurry glances and finally declared that they had something important to tell me, hinting at an ulterior motive. Bracing myself, I tried to stay calm. Charles let out a deep sigh before revealing what I had already suspected. He had sold the house to his parents. He then bluntly proposed a divorce, and his parents, nodding in agreement, looked pleased with themselves, their smirking faces showing that they had been plotting this all along. Despite the shocking revelation, I stayed composed. I had seen this coming and prepared myself for this moment. Without hesitation, I signed the divorce papers, took off my wedding ring, placed it on the table, and calmly declared that I would be leaving the house for a while. I had been suspicious of Charles and his parents, especially with their increasing visits when I wasn't around to confirm my doubts. I had installed hidden surveillance cameras around the house connected to my phone. I monitored their conversations daily, and one day, I stumbled upon footage of Charles and his parents joyfully discussing their plan to sell the house. Shocked but determined, I knew I had to act quickly. In the days that followed, I quietly made plans for my next move. Using the information I gathered from the surveillance footage, I decided to transfer the home loan, which was still under my name, to Charles. If they wanted to kick me out of the house I had worked so hard for, they could take on the mortgage as well. After all, the $5,500 monthly payments had always come from my hard-earned salary. I doubted that Charles and his parents, now unemployed, would be able to manage the payments without my help. I resolved not to provide any further financial support. Once everything was in place, I moved into my new home, a well-arranged cozy space furnished with new items I had carefully chosen for this fresh start. I was finally free from the burdens of my old life, ready to begin a new chapter. On my first day off in my new place, I relished the idea of having some much-needed rest. I slept in late, enjoying the quiet peace of my new surroundings. But just as I was about to doze off again, the doorbell rang unexpectedly. To my surprise, Charles and his parents stood at my doorstep, uninvited. Without waiting for an answer, they barged into my home, clearly upset. They spread out a document in front of me and accused me of changing the name on the house loan without their permission. Apparently, they had received the paperwork shortly after I left, and it came as a shock to them. Their expressions of disbelief told me they hadn't anticipated this. Charles and his parents angrily explained that they were all unemployed and couldn't afford the high monthly payments. Charles, in a furious outburst, declared that they would not pay the loan, as if refusing to face the reality of the situation. Calmly, I tried to explain the consequences of defaulting on the mortgage. I told them how interest and late fees would add up, increasing the final amount they would owe. Charles seemed skeptical at first, but as he searched for information online, his expression quickly changed. The weight of what I had done finally sank in. Shock and distress crossed his face as he realized the financial burden that now rested solely on his shoulders. I suggested that they look for new jobs to make a fresh start. Their features got paler even as the situation's truth set in. They acknowledged that they had no assets or money to fall back on, 
and that Charles was struggling with large gambling debts and had no steady source of income. They begged me for sympathy and assistance, desperate, and they reminded me of the years we had spent together. I was unfazed by their entreaties, though. I was determined not to fall into the same trap of aiding them again after everything they had put me through. They tried to guilt trip me into changing my mind because they were frustrated by my rejection, but I swiftly put an end to their attempts to make things right. As their desperation increased, they made a desperate attempt to denounce me to the authorities, accusing me of having changed the mortgage without their permission. The authorities quickly got involved and Charles and his parents were finally taken off my land. They had to relocate to a smaller, more economical flat on the outskirts of town due to serious financial issues. While it was far from the comfortable life they had known, Charles was able to assist his parents by working a part-time job. My life, however, continued to be stable, and I was able to concentrate on my work without having to worry about the turmoil they had caused. I always had an interest for homemade crafts, so in my spare time I began a blog about them. I was surprised to learn that the site was getting traffic and that I was soon making twice as much money as I was previously. I was inundated with requests to do seminars and courses, and I discovered that I was busy than ever, but in a way that made me happy and fulfilled. I wouldn't be getting married again. I realized that after all I had gone through, I was happy to get by on my own in life. I once stumbled upon an old home account book from the beginning of my marriage when sorting through some old stuff. I was reminded as I turned through its pages of the financial difficulties Charles and I had experienced together and how hard we had had to work at that time to make ends meet. But I felt a sense of resolution instead of sadness. Those early days had been a long time ago, and now I was creating a new bliss for myself the way I wanted it. Knowing that I had permanently closed that chapter of my life, I put the account book back on the shelf and prepared myself to face the future with assurance. 